And now, it's time for Mob Talk Radio with your host, Jeff Canarsie. write post-it notes on my computer don't go over your time get to the point uh but a part of what i enjoy doing um and, and a part of the magic of of doing this sort of thing is sometimes you get on rabbit trails uh but what i'm not going to do because i i thought about this this was a two-day uh recording i recorded the bulk of everything yesterday and today is friday it's almost noon and I was going to sort of, because the thing about Scarpa is you have to understand, I'm dealing with 250 pages of just one volume. There's like 20 volumes, literally. There's 20 volumes of this. So when you do, and some of them have four and 500 pages. So the volume and the amount of things that Greg Scarpa gave government is just fucking insane. So what I have to do is I have to go through all of just the, the one sample that I do have. And I went through all 250 pages and it's not just reading the pages, but then it's researching exactly what was going on. Uh, And I do that not because I don't know it off the top of my head, because most of this stuff I do. Most of the stuff I know what's accurate and what's not. I've been doing this a long time, but I always, always, always attempt to just cross reference just to make sure because I don't want to tell you something that's not right. You know, I don't want to tell you that's not true and then come to find out it is true. But if that's a situation that happens on this show, I'm the first one to come back and tell you so. So everything that I, so like, I guess what I'm trying to explain is the process is I get all of these pages and I literally read through every single page two and three times. I go through the whole bundle. Then I cross-reference everything. Then I have my knowledge, the the stuff I do know about. So then I'm writing notes on everything. So this isn't like I printed out a bunch of pages and I just read it and I give you my shitty opinion and we, we move on. I make sure that everything that I'm telling you is like in the upper 90% accurate. There's some stuff I'm never going to be able to tell you if it was accurate or not completely accurate. But... The we are not going to go through the whole entire catalog of 302s with Greg Scarpa. We will do another show probably next week. We may do four of these. I'm not sure, but I try to really pick stuff that's relevant. And the stuff that I chose to do today, I think I left out like 25 pages. Said, ah, this is just you know recycled sort of nonsense uh, because there are things that Greg Scarpa has said that are accurate. And I, I think I told you that last week. I'm telling you that again. There are some things that are accurate. However, there's sort of a rub. And the rub is is that while he may tell them one or two items that are accurate, there's 75 that come after it that are complete lies. And here's my issue. And, And this is a point I would like to make because one of the arguments I constantly get on this show is you say all informants lie, but then you turn around and you say, but he told the truth here. Here's the deal. Anytime you have an informant, the one thing that they, they, they know going into the gate, they hold more cards than the FBI does. Now, if they can swing a deal and get what they want out of it, which is usually no jail time, no prison time, and a low, set, uh, not a low fucking uh, financial penalty, which none of them pay back anyway. Every informant that you see on YouTube, they all owe hundreds of thousands of dollars, and, and some of them in the millions. Uh, and restitution to the government. You see Sammy Gravano, for instance, who's probably, and I estimated it, that he's making around s- anywhere between one to $3 million uh, a year. That's just on his ad revenue on YouTube alone, okay? Then when you just talk about the sheer numbers he's getting, he's probably making three to $5 million a year off YouTube. How much of that money do you think is going back to the restitution for the government? 
Ain't zero. Michael Francis owes the government a ton of money. Hasn't paid a dime. Ain't uh, every single informant that you see, none of them are paying any restitution. Uh, unfortunately for civilians such as myself, if you don't pay your restitution, they violate your probation. You go to prison. That's how it works. If you don't pay, you see a lot of times in this, uh, I'm not saying low level organized crime, but you see in organized crime cases, if some guys, if they don't pay, they go right back to jail. The government picks and choose who they're going to fuck with. And that's just the reality of it. So when you have a situation, when an informant decides he's going to cooperate, he gives them a couple of things. He'll give them just enough for them to kind of verify easy stuff to verify, not impossible stuff. You know, nobody's going to walk in and say, I know where Jimmy Hoff is buried. Nobody's going to say that, but they're going to go in and they're going to give them. They already know what organized crime task force squad they're working with. They already know the agents. They know what they're going to be looking for. Murder is the big one. Anytime you can get a rat to talk about murder, it's like fucking jerking a guy off because that's really the only penalty that is going to guarantee a motherfucker is never getting out of prison. Never going to get out of prison. Racketeering, yeah, whatever. You know, usually in a racketeering, the most you're going to get is 25, 35. Some guys have gotten life in prison without, but there's always murders attached to that. So murder is the big one. So if you can't provide murders, you had better be able to provide serious shit. Otherwise, it's not worth it to the FBI. So what they do is they go in and they kind of sit there and they let the FBI fish for information. Anybody that thinks a fucking informant walks in there and it's like, oh, let me get you a steak. Let me get you cigarettes. Let me get you a hooker. Let me get whatever you need to make you feel comfortable. And we're going to have a great conversation. We're going to hang out. We're going to go play golf. We're going to jerk each other off in a closet. And you're going to be the United States fucking hero. It doesn't work like that. They sit around and they basically tell the informant what they're looking for. So the informant can go through his mind sort of cherry picking enough to wet their beaks if he can wet their beaks here comes the money once the money starts here comes what we can do for you and then they'll tell them about unsolved cases unsolved murders they'll talk about a murder that happened in 1986 and all of a sudden a motherfucker's memory gets sparked so it, it, it's 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 information on a need-to-know basis only uh, when we do our Sammy Gravano documentary, you're going to find out that Sammy Gravano knew nothing about a murder on a Tuesday, but then on, you know, when it came time to testify, oh, all of a sudden he remembered. How does that happen? This is a guy who is on his YouTube platform. He described Paul Castellano's cock pump for two fucking hours. He talked about a cock pump, uh, you know. <laughs> He apparently found somebody who had one and said, well, show it to me. I want to see how it works. First of all, no straight man does that. That's number one. If you're into cock, that's your thing. By all means, have a ball, have a blast. But no straight man is going to do that, especially a mob guy. So the fact that he goes into all of these intricate details about a guy's fucking cock pump for two fucking hours that happened in 1990 and he can remember all those details, and then he can describe what a what a guy's suit looked like, the texture, the color, the material. But he can't remember a fucking murder? You gotta be kidding me. But it's because here he has a convenient memory. And you're gonna find out when we do that documentary that he just made the shit up. He knew the FBI wanted this murder. He says he doesn't remember. Then he then he admits under oath, under cross examination. He says, oh, well, I didn't remember at the time. And, and then I started thinking about it. And like two hours later, I suddenly remembered. So I called the FBI. Bullshit. Get the fuck out of here. You would have remembered it right then and there. It's murder. It's not like some broad you met in a bar and you banged because you were drunk. You know, I'm sure that's happened to people before, to women and to men. You go home with somebody at the bar. You always remember what their face looks like. You might not want to, but you always remember. It's convenient. The old myth of, well, I got drunk and don't remember what I did. Yes, you did. But the booze allowed you to just not give a fuck. I think everybody in this world slept with somebody that they probably regret sleeping with. That's just reality. So the fact that you conveniently say, oh, I was really drunk. You know, what happened? Bullshit. You knew what happened. You're just trying to look to get that fucking memory etched out of your brain. But in the case of Gravano, he just straight up fucking lied. So I go back 
to the beginning of what I was saying is that sometimes they do tell the truth on small stuff, easy stuff the government can corroborate. Can they lie about so much other shit? We talked about it last week. Greg Scarpa's telling you he's a captain in 1963, 64. He didn't get inducted till 58, 59. You mean to tell me this guy was such a fucking superstar that he gets inducted in 58, 59, and by 63, he's a captain. Fuck out of here. It's a bullshit. It's not even accurate. He doesn't become a captain until 1977, but it doesn't stop him from telling the FBI he is a capo. And the reason why he's telling them that is because he wants to sound more important than he is. Because if he's just a low-level fucking crumb bum, then he wouldn't know X, Y, and Z. And so the, the, the portrait that I'm trying to paint to you is, listen, the mob is like anything else. Everybody kind of knows what's going on. I mean, it's not like this hidden bullshit where you don't understand what's going on. But he would have understood nothing that, that the boss of the family was doing. He wouldn't have had the luxury of sitting down at high-level meetings with a boss. It's just the truth. In a smaller crime family, that may be accurate. But we're talking about the Colombo crime family here, not the fucking, uh, the, the, uh, whatever the fuck, the Oklahoma mafia or whatever the fuck. So some of the things that he had intricate details of are just ludicrous. He wouldn't have had them. He wouldn't have been in a situation to sit down with any boss to debate who was going to do what to who and why. It's the same thing that we got in the question earlier. And the question earlier that we got was, well, you know, Carlo Gambino had to explain to Andy Ruggiano why he killed Albert Anastasia. Are you fucking kidding me? That's the mentality you need to have when you look at these paper papers. Uh, and, and the reality is, is Greg Scarpa told some, some truth. But he told some whopper fucking lies, too, which is going to lead to this question. And the question is going to be, and then we'll get started on this paperwork. The question will be, is that did the FBI really need to coach Joe Valachi? Because obviously they're talking to Greg Scarpa. He's given them everything, the commission, the, the rankings, you know, how everything works. So did they really need to coach Valachi? And I think I might have said a week or two ago, probably not, but Somebody brought up a really good point to me the other day in an email. I believe it was an email is that that would give the FBI even more reason to coach him. And that is true because they're getting information from Scarpa. They feed it to Valachi. He can verify a couple of things here and there, but they need a poster boy to say everything that, that Greg Scarpa has been telling them. And they used that and Joe Valachi. Uh, and, and that's the way I think it went down. Do I think that Valachi gave up all this crazy information they didn't already know? No, I don't think he did, but they used him as the poster boy and Greg Scarpa was the screenplay for what he was going to say. And that I firmly believe you'll never talk me out of that. But uh, for the, in the history of organized crime, everybody has blamed Joe Valachi for everything. But the truth is it was Greg Scarpa. It was Greg Scarpa. So with all that being said, uh, we're going to jump into the paperwork and we're going to find out today the big reason uh, why Greg Scarpa became an informant. And like I said, it, it had nothing to do with money or excuse me. It had nothing to do with the fact that he was facing charges. Um, so basically, uh, this is going to be dated 1962. I think it was in... Oh, let me look here. I, in like, I think May of 62. Uh, and basically, Greg Scarpa is giving a dissertation on where the mafia began. Uh, the organization was known at one time as the Black Hand, which the title was derived from the symbol of the organization, which was a black handprint. He stated that if the black handprint was found on the door of a home, it indicated that a member of the family in this home had violated the rule of the organization and was slated for death. That's not actually true. Uh, they shook everybody down the black hand. It, it had nothing to do with just the organization itself. That was their calling card. So, uh, you know, just for historical reference, he stated that if a black handprint was found on the door, it, it indicated that a member of the family had violated a rule of the organization and was slated for death. The informant stated, which we know is Greg Scarpa, the uh, name Camarada, which Camora is what I think they meant originated in the Neapolitan branch of the organization, but that eventually the Black Hand Mafia and 
camarada, which is should be Camora, were all anonymous terms are synonymous terms and referred only to one organization. Uh, which we know isn't true either because the Camorra was a little everybody it was yes, it was all mafia, but they were very different organizations. Informant advised that the present time there is no name for the overall organization, which is now made up of numerous groups which are known as families, which operate throughout the whole entire world, with the exception of the communist dominated areas he pointed out that the organization was active in cuba until the rise of fidel castro but that to his knowledge there was no organized activity in cuba at the present time uh and so now he just basically describes everything uh greg scarpa informs us the boss or representative uh or the boss is the head of the family (coughs) and a member of the overall concerning body of this organization is called the commission The underboss, the person who will act for the boss in absence of the boss and is number two man in power in the family. Consulary or counselor who is the uh, neutral counsel for anyone in the family who needs his advice or services in settling disputes and is available to represent members of the family who have been accused of violations of rules. Uh, Capital regime or captain, a person who has a group of members under him and follows his orders. He also relates the orders to the boss, from the boss to the individual members. There is not a set number of members who are assigned to a captain, and all captains hold equal rank regardless of the number of individuals assigned to them. Acting captain. The acting captain is appointed by the captain with the approval of the boss and acts for the captain in his absence. Goodfellas, button men, soldier, a member of the family who has not attained any rank of authority, but has merely been initiated into the organization. <coughs> Greg Scarpa advised that the procedure for making a new member is as follows. So what I want you guys to do is right after I read this part, pause the show and go over to the Senate committee hearings with Joe Valachi. This is almost fucking verbatim. Okay. A member of the family becomes acquainted with one, uh, with someone he feels has the qualifications and is acceptable for membership. When a member, uh, the member will then control the direct activities of this person and generally observe his actions for a period of six months to a year, after which he will propose that individual and be accepted for membership. To propose a person for membership, the member making the proposal will go to his captain, furnish the name, address, members of the family, as much additional background information as possible concerning the proposed member. The captain will then present the name of the one who has been proposed in a meeting of all the captains, the boss, the underboss, and the consulier. If the proposed new member is accepted to those at the meeting, a thorough background investigation will be conducted on him, which includes relatives, and it will be determined if the person was ever a government witness, ever furnished information to the police. Uh, During the period that the proposed new member is being directed towards membership, he will be led to believe before being admitted as a member that it will be necessary for him to kill someone. Uh, Greg Scarpa states that prior to about 10 years ago, so that would have been 42, uh, it was necessary for a proposed new member to participate in the execution of a member before being accepted into the organization. He stated that the rule had been abandoned, but each proposed new member is still led to believe that he must participate in a murder prior to becoming a member. Excuse me. Uh, Informant states that members can be taken into the organization only during certain periods when the bosses are authorized by the commission to accept new members. He stated that the last new members were accepted into the organization about 1957, and since that time, the commission is not authorized to make any new members which would be accurate because Carlo Gambino closed the books. But I believe it was a little bit after 1957. I think it was like 1958 or 1959. But either way, doesn't really matter. doesn't change much because guys still made guys anyway. Uh, after the investigation is completed on the, propo- on the proposed member, he is then summoned to a meeting at which he will be present Uh, at which will be present the boss, the underboss, the consulier, all the captains, and the sponsor, the member who proposed him. The proposed new member will be questioned by the boss regarding his willingness to kill on order to obey other orders given to him, and etc. If these questions are answered in the affirmative, the proposed new member 
uh, his sponsor and the sponsor's captain will then stand up and the boss will pierce the trigger finger of the proposed new member with a needle and draw blood from his finger. Following this, following this, a piece of paper is placed in the hand of the proposed new member, lighted, then cupped between the two hands while it burns. While this paper is burning, he repeats the following oath in Italian. With this oath, I swear that if I ever violate the oath, I may burn as this paper. It is required that the father of a member be Italian. However, the mother may be of any other nationality and the member may marry a person of any nationality. Greg Scarpa stated that if a member of a family moves from one location to another, he's given a letter of introduction by his boss to the boss in that area, which he is moving. That's bullshit. No boss is going to give you a letter and say, okay, take this to uh, Santo Traficante down in Florida, show him this letter. It's not just not how it works. I, I don't understand why he would even say that. Um, you know, but anyway, the letter entitles the member to be accepted into membership into the family covering that area in which he moves. The only way a member can meet another member is to be introduced by a third member who is acquainted with both <coughs> and know that both are members of the organization. He stated that when introducing one member to another person, making the introduction must use the phrase a friend of ours. He stated that when the above phrase is used, the parties being introduced then know that they're both members of the organization. It is a violation uh, of the rules for a member to introduce himself to another person as a member, even though he may know that this other person is also a member. Uh, Greg Scarper related that all executions are authorized by the boss uh, and the persons who perform the executions are assigned the job by the boss. Greg Scarpa also related that all the bosses are members of the commission and that if a problem arises, which requires action by the commission, a commission, a group. Okay. Hold on. I got lost here. Uh, informant related that all the bosses are members of the commission and that if a problem arises that requires action by the commission, a group of bosses is appointed to serve as the commission for this particular issue. He stated that the member uh, serving on the commission for any problem will vary with the seriousness of the problem and its effect of the overall operation of the organization. Uh, in addition to the above informant furnished the identities of some members of families in the New York area, as well as the identity of the individuals who hold positions in the Profaci family. The Bureau will be furnished more detailed results of the interview and a separate communication captioned the Criminal Commission et al. New York 92 2300. So what Greg is simply doing here is giving them the background of the mob. He's given them the functionality of the commission. He's giving them the ranks, positions, and how they work. Now, most people might say, okay, well, that's, you know, whatever. But at the end of the day, nobody before has given them this information. Uh, the FBI, Jed Hoover. Uh, knew knew the organized crime existed. Everybody did, but they didn't know the functionality. They didn't know the ins and outs. And here's Greg Scarpa in 1962 giving them the roadmap. It's despicable. It's despicable, but he has to give them something. And we're about to find out why. We are about to find out why, and it's not for the reason you might suspect. All right. So more or less, what we have here is it's dated June 23rd, 1962. This is directly from the director of the FBI, uh, top echelon criminal informant program. Um, this was dated on the 18th, but not filed till the 28th. Bureau authorization. Now, granted, remember when I told you guys that I had... Um, redacted unredacted paperwork this is unredacted i don't think anybody has this because now i know how much they were paying him uh there's a couple that the fbi actually did insert the, the payment but the ones i'm going to read to you today i don't think anybody has so bureau authorizes granted pay to the above captioned individual gregory scarpa twenty thousand dollars in separate payments of five hundred dollars weekly in the event this informant does not continue to provide substantial and significant information, the second payment of twenty thousand should not be made. So right off the gate, they're giving him forty grand. All right. Uh, proximity advised the bureau results in contracts with Gregory Scarpa. 
Um, okay, so let's go to this next page. And this is going to be United States Memorandum uh, from the director of the FBI dated June 18th, 1962, SAC New York. Uh, the subject, Gregory Scarpa, Top Echelon Criminal Informant Program. Uh, New York L to Air tells to director on 6662 and 6762. The informant is not paid on a regular scale, but is paid on cash on delivery basis. The informant has been paid $20,000 on SAC authority in compliance with section uh, 108J2 manual of instruction and based on the authority of assistant director C.A. Evans based on the information provided through 6662 in connection with the above captioned case, Gregory Scarpa. It is requested that the Bureau authorize payments of $20,000 to the informant at this time. The informant states, now this is very, 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 very important, okay? Uh, well, maybe not. Maybe this is the wrong page. No, it's coming up. But just start listening to all of this. The informant states that he is a capo regime, and the Joe Provacci crime family, the informant has a, at present time has 10 men under his control and has been a member of this organization since 1951. We know that's not true. He was not inducted until 50, 58 or 59. And he's, you know, he's, he's claiming he's been around the organization longer than that. Maybe he was an associate, but he was not a made guy uh, in 1951. He might've been an associate. So 51 may be uh, realistic, but he was not officially a member until 58, 59 when he got inducted. He did not become a fucking captain in the Colombo crime family, which was the Profaci crime family, until 1977. Those are facts. So he's lying. Um, the fact that he's saying he has 10 men under him is absolute bullshit. And when we get to the point where he tells... When he became a captain and who made him a captain, you're really going to roll your fucking eyes. Uh, let's see. Uh, the FBI has a little note here that they suspect that he's not a captain and that they think he's at least a made guy. So they're already calling his bluff on this. So that, that I find to be interesting. Uh, it is noted that the informant has indicated that he will press for advancement within the group if the bureau desires that advancement so uh, if if he's saying he's already a captain he's basically saying well if the fbi wants me to become a consigliere or an underboss or a boss i'm willing to do it but you guys got to pay me to do it so the fact is let's just break it down in terms of this if he was a captain he would have known sir he would have known a lot of different things okay a lot of like high powered things depending okay but the idea here that the FBI is speculating he's only just a fucking made guy and, and, and nothing more is is the truth. That's accurately what Greg Scarpa was at this time, but he's lying to them. And I think that they kind of know. But when he makes the suggestion to them that, well, if you guys want me to move up in the ranks, you know, we can do that. Now we're about to find out. uh exactly what the game here is all right the informant has provided information on a continuous basis concerning the feud between the profaci and gallo groups which has been of great value he described in detail the organizational setup of a family within the overall criminal organization in addition the informant uh is in the process of identifying by name and photographs a large number of additional members in the profaci family he is also in the process of attempting to identify the members of other the other four fucking crime families through the rank of capo regime. So he's basically telling them, give me photos, give me whatever, I'll tell you who everybody is. It should be noted that none of this information is currently available to the New York office from an admitted member of a criminal organization. So in other words, nobody has ever fucking told them this shit. He is the first clown to ever do this shit. At the present time, the informant manages a numbers operation in Brooklyn for Charlie Lo Cicero, who is the consigliere of the Profaci crime family. The informant is currently required to make payments of $150 a week to Lo Cicero from this numbers operation. He stated that, that, that as a result of the Gallo Profaci feud and as a result 
of stepped up local police action against gamblers, the numbers business has fallen off badly. Bullshit. Bullshit. This is 19 fucking 62. That was the fucking, if there was, you ever heard the fucking phrase, see this shit pisses me off because if you ever heard the fucking phrase uh, at your peak, that was the peak for the numbers operation, the 40s, 50s, and like early 60s was mid peak. Everybody was making millions in the racket biz, in the fucking numbers business. This clown is going to tell you as just a simple made guy, he's running somebody's numbers operation. He's only kicking up 150 a week. And the reason why he, because if Greg Scarpa was truly doing what he alleges he was doing, 150 a week is nothing. Because a, a fucking consulier or a captain would take 10 times that amount of money. So it must not be either it's a very piss poor numbers operation or it doesn't exist. But he also has to say, oh, you know, I got to pay 150 a week. But now we're going to find out. <coughs> Greg Scarpa advised that he always must maintain a reputation for being a money man, an earner, and in that to indicate to anyone that he is in need of money could seriously injure his reputation within the organization. So he's telling them he's busted. He doesn't have two fucking dimes to rub together. He wants to be known as an earner because he knows if he's an earner, he can rise the ranks. That's just the truth. He stated that he cannot ask for money from the organization because of his status and reputation at this time is anticipating an assignment to pay the cost incurred by the family in the Gallo Profaci feud. Informant stated that he is extremely bad in bad shape financially to the extent that he has pawned his jewelry, rings, and watches in his wife's wedding ring for money. So all of this bullshit you keep he's running a numbers racket and he has to pawn everything he fucking owns. What a fucking dumb fucking clown this guy is can't rub two dimes together this is greg scarpa who has lied his whole entire life he was a fucking earner he made all this crazy fucking money he's busted he's got nothing now you know why he turned to the fbi because it was an easy fucking paycheck informant also indicated that he does um that he does not desire to participate in any local burglaries or commit any other crimes because of his relationship with with the agents and the remote possibility that he would be caught, which would at least temporarily end his usefulness to the Bureau. He stated that he must obtain money from some source to maintain his reputation and status in the organization. There you have it. There it is right there. He's busted. He doesn't know how to fucking earn. So now he, he's telling them, well, I'm not going to break no crimes. Bullshit. That's, that's all he continued to do. Oh, he didn't break in the house. It's bullshit. He advised, he advises us he is currently indebted to the amount of $3,000 and that if he were in a position to pay off these debts, he feels that his income from the organization's activities would be sufficient to cover his operating expenses and maintain his position within the organization. Money grab. Do you not see it for what it is? It's a fucking money grab at the time the informant was originally contacted by agents he was in the process of attempting to bring his activities in the organization to a minimum okay that's see, that's bullshit too because anybody's from the streets knows it's a grind you don't stop if one thing don't work something else has got to you just grind and grind i've grinded my whole fucking life it's called hustling that's what you do he was bringing his his activities to a halt right because no matter what, your captain expects you to kick up every fucking two weeks, every week, whatever the case may be, however much he wants, whatever the case. This guy was a bum, a fucking bum. Couldn't rub two dimes together. Fuck out of here, this prick. Uh, he stated that he had ceased all activities relating to the organization, except those that, that were absolutely necessary. The informant related that he could not resign from the organization, but that by withdrawing from all except essential activities, he could more or less retire. Well, he just said, uh, the informant states he cannot resign from the organization, but he can withdraw from everything and could more or less retire. He just said two different fucking things. He could have walked if he wanted to. 
Who the, if he's not earning no money, what the fuck is the point? Why does anybody get involved in organized crime? If you don't know how to make money, you're fucking worthless to everybody. Because that's what it's about. It's not 1930. We don't need to kill fucking 12 people this month. During the period of this, uh, Greg Scarpa's development by the NY New York office agents, the informant has reactivated his status within the organization in an attempt to be in a position where he could obtain information of greater value to the Bureau. Let me read that again, because this is very important. During the period, that means the whole time that they were trying to get Scarpa to start ratting, the informant has reactivated his status in the organization, which means he wasn't, if you read it like they write it, that means he wasn't doing anything. He was not active, which I think is his way of basically acknowledging what I've always suspected about Greg Scarpe. He was a fucking nothing. He became something. I don't think we can disagree there. I'm not saying he was a chump or nothing, but what I'm saying to you is he was not nearly as big as he tried to, to boast to uh, preen it like a fucking peacock. He's preening like a peacock all over the strut and all over the fucking FBI office. And then reality is he's really nobody in that life. So you've already seen him say, well, uh, I'm not going to admit if I'm a member in the organization. He goes from that, and in three months, he's a captain. And when I tell you how he, how he tells them he became a captain, you're going to puke in your pants. The informant has repeatedly stating, oh, here we go, hold on. This reactivation process has necessitated that the informant spend more time with other members of the Profaci group at a considerable expense to himself. Oh, I'm sorry. Listen, let me tell you something about the streets, especially in those days. If you're an active member of the mafia, you stop showing up, you stop hanging around, people are going to start to think you're a fucking rat. You can't afford to just not be around. So you guys take your guess on what you think that fucking means. Uh, okay. The informant stated that he feels he is now attaining the position where he will be able to furnish information on a continuous basis and will continue to do so as long as the Bureau is desirous of his assistance. In other words, pay me. Pay me. And that's the other thing. He tells you he's a captain. He tells you he ceased operations. He has to reactivate himself. You're a fucking captain. You can't just decide well, you know what? I'm going to take a break for three months and I'll come back around. It doesn't work like that. And the government's so fucking stupid that they buy it hook, line, and fucking sinker. You take a high-end captain. Let's let's pick a captain out of thin air. Um, let's go with... Uh, see, the problem is I, I, I go to people that I know and I don't want to do that. <laughs> we'll... we'll, we'll, we'll uh, John Francis, let's pretend he's a captain, okay? You mean to tell me that John Francis goes from being made to three months later becoming a captain? Okay, let's just play with this for a minute. So in three months, he becomes a captain, but he decides, you know what? I don't think I'm going to go around that much. I'm going to take three months, four months off. Do you really think he would keep his rank? Do you really think the other people in the crime family aren't going to start scratching their fucking heads going, you know what? Something ain't adding up with this fucking prick. Do you see where I'm going with all this? I hope you guys can see it. And listen, I know I'm anti-rat, anti-government, and I get it. But I'm giving you literally off of fucking government paperwork. I can't make this shit up. Uh, the informant has repeatedly stated that the FBI is the only police agency, local, state, or federal, in which he has any confidence. Well, no, it's because they got the biggest fucking checkbook, you fuck. He has stated that in the event that he is suspected by any members of the organization for furnishing information, it would automatically mean his death with no chance to explain or defend his actions. He stated that his life is dependent, dependent entirely upon the matter in which the contracts are made, or excuse me, the contacts are made, and the manner of which the information provided by him is handled to protect his identity. So in other words, he's scared shitless somebody's going to dime him out. The following is a brief description of the information furnished by Greg Scarpa thus far concerning criminal organization. The informant is considered to be emotionally stable. <laughs> yeah, they had no idea who they were dealing with and reliable. 
uh, and has furnished no information known to be false. Bullshit. I've just told you 70 fucking things that weren't accurate. Uh, the criminal com- the criminal commission anti-racketeering 92-2300 informant stated that the movement had its origin in Sicily years ago where the majority of people were oppressed by the feudal lords. Oh God. And he was organ. It was organized at that time on a Robin hood basis or the idea of stealing from the rich to give to the poor. He stated, however, that this as time went on and it is typical under dictatorships or power organizations, those who were in power became hungry for power and money and that the movement changed from stealing from the rich to give to the poor from stealing from the rich to give to the bosses. Informant stated that this organization or group continued from that time to the present and has been known at different periods of this time as the Black Hand, the Mafia, Camarada, which he meant Camorra. He stated that the name Camarada <laughs> originated with the Neapolitan branch of the organization, but that actually in terms are all synonymous and refer to only one organization, which is not really accurate. He stated that the Black Hand originated from within a Sicilian group, and the title was derived from the symbol of the organization, which is a black handprint. He stated that at this time, this name was used if a family found it on their front door, blah, blah, blah. He's, he's just regurgitating himself, indicated the family a member had violated a rule and they would be killed. Okay. Informant stated that at the present time, there is no name for the organ- overall organization and that the organization is now made up of numerous groups that are known as families and which operate through the entire world with the exception of the communist dominated areas blah 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 we've talked about that informant stated that each family throughout the world is made up okay uh the boss we've he's just repeating what the positions are um a member of the family who becomes acquainted or is it acquainted with the person okay we've hit that one um let me just scan this. Um, okay, he's... Oh, wow. Hold on a second. Uh, the foreman stated that after the investigation of a proposed member has been completed, if the new number members are being accepted, the proposed member will be summoned to a meeting place, which will be in a home, an apartment, a hotel, a restaurant, and present. We know they'll be the boss. We know how they're going to uh, induct them. Uh, the boss asks if he is left-handed or right-handed, and he indicates to extend the right finger if he's right-handed, the left hand if he's left-handed. The boss will then take the pin and prick the trigger finger until blood is drawn. He then passes into the proposed member's hand a piece of paper, generally tissue paper, sets it on fire, blah, 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 with this oath, blah, blah, blah. He's just kind of sort of going back over um everything okay this is what i wanted to get to so we know that he's talked about the commission okay and he's explained how the commission functions but this shit that he gives next is just brutal uh with regard to the joe profaci family he advised that joe profaci is the boss joe magliaco is the underboss and that charlie lo cicero is the acting con- con- counsel excuse me consulier of the family he stated that in addition, there are eight captains in the family consisting of uh, Ambrose uh, Magliaco, who was not, uh, Sam Battalamente, Harry Fontana, uh, Simone, John uh, Otto, Greg Scarpa. So he includes himself in this little list. And a bunch of these names that he did kind of mention wasn't accurate, which is a little strange. Uh, in addition to all of this, the informant has to date provided the identities of 25 people in varying positions uh, who he knows to be members of the organization. He has stated that there are five families in the New York area, which are controlled by the following people. You ready for this? He does this in 1962. Joe Profaci, boss of the Profaci crime family. Carlo Gambino, boss of the Gambino crime family. Joe Bonanno, boss of the Bonanno crime family. Vito Genovese, boss of the Genovese crime family. Tommy Lucchese, boss of the Lucchese crime family. Raymond Patriarca, boss of the New England crime family. Santo Traficante, boss of Tampa. Joe Zarilli, boss of Detroit. He gives them everything. The informant stated that the punishment for a violation of the rules of this organization was a reprimand. 
by the boss or a death, depending on the seriousness of his violation. According to the informant, a uh, violation of the following rules is punishable by death, furnishing information to cops, having an affair with another maid member's wife. He says the wife will also be killed. That's not true. Uh, a married member having an affair with another a member's sister or daughter stealing from another member, anyone striking a member knowing him to be a member and not being involved in the sale of narcotics, which is hilarious because we all know they were selling drugs. He stated that a reprimand is usually the result of arguments between two members or some other minor activity, uh, blah, blah, blah. A comparison of the information furnished by the by this informant with information received from Joe Valachi. So, uh, and other informants. So they were talking to a couple of different people. Um, <clears throat> and keep in mind, Greg Scarpa came first. Uh, the information is accurate and uh, provable. A portion of the information received to date from the inf from Greg Scarpa has been previously received from a couple other for informants. However, this informant's the only informant in the New York area who has been able to supply all of the information that we are talking about in our memorandums the informant also was able to furnish more details and supply dozens and dozens of names which are not available from any other source the full potential of this informant is yet to be realized however how can it <laughs> yet to be realized he just gave you the whole entire mop you, you clown uh uh okay so the full potential of this informant is yet to be realized however it is felt that if the requested payment is authorized, it will solidify the informant's faith in the Bureau and provide the necessary incentive for the informant to be f to fully reactivate himself in the organization so that he will be in even better position to give assistance to the Bureau. It is recommended that the Bureau approve $55,000 to be paid to the informant for the information he furnished for additional information, which he is yet to furnish and for information. He will immediately come forth with in the future as well as incentive for the informant. It's also recommended that payments be made and in installments of $3,500 initially and additionally, an additional $35,000 for additional interviews with the informant. This guy is, you've heard the numbers. You've heard the numbers. You know what the fuck they're doing. They're paying him. This is it. This is a money grab for him. Um, this method of payment is recommended so there will be no doubt in the informant's mind that he is to be paid only as information is received. So in other words, they'll give him a little advance here and there. But he's got to come up with shit for them to give him a lot of money. And he didn't have to pay tax on this. Uh, so we are like, here's the thing, right? I really, really want to keep going because there's something that I have that is, is absolutely uh, going to blow your mind. So let me, let me, let me, I'm going to stop this really quick. It, you won't hear me stop, but I, I need to look at one or two things because I cannot do the next 25, 30 pages I have because they all kind of come together. And it's it's going to be, you, if you guys remember Joe Magliacco and what he did, remember Joe Magliacco combined forces with Joe Bonanno and him and Joe Bonanno were going to whack the whole entire commission. Carlo Gambino finds out, they call Joe Magliacco and they end up shelving him. They could have killed him, but they shelved him. Uh, and remember, Joe Colombo is the guy that ratted everybody out. So we know the history of Joe Magliacco. But you are not going to believe the shit Greg Scarpa says about Joe Magliacco. It, it's absolutely bonkers, batshit crazy. Because none of it's true. None of it's true. Um, so I'm going to stop this really quick. And, and you'll hear, hear from me in a second. Hold on. All right. So here's what we're going to do. Rather than start this now. Because if I don't, we're going to be here four and a half hours. And I would rather save this for next week. Uh, but basically, I am going to read one more little form. So remember when I told you that he said to the FBI that 
He was three thousand dollars in debt. Well, the FBI is paying him all this fucking money, but there the day after he tells them, "Listen, you know, if, if I can get this three thousand dollar debt paid, I can continue to do my stuff." And what we have is a memorandum from the FBI headquarters. The informant has advised us he's currently heavily in debt to the amount of three thousand. He feels that he can e- if he can easily pay off these debts. His income from the organization would pay operating expenses and maintain his position in the organization. Uh, so what do they do? They give Greg Scarpa another $10,000 <laughs> so he can pay his fucking debt. If approved, the attached letter to be forward, New York authorizing more payments to this informant and installments totaling 20000 So now we're up to thirty grand. So it, it, it's, it's, it's a money grab. Nothing more, nothing less. So, what we're going to do next week, uh, and listen, this show is way too long, but what we're going to do next week is this. We know that Greg Scarpa was not technically, was not an official member inducted with an organized crime until 1958, okay? He lies and says 51. It's not true. Then he's not made a captain until 1977 and 1977 was a big year carlo gambino dies paul castellano you know we 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 know but here's the thing what we're going to find out next week is that greg scarpa is going to explain to the fbi who made him a captain and why and it's according to greg scarpa joe magliacco makes him a captain and he doesn't just say we're going to promote him oh no Greg Scarpa's at high-level meetings between Magliaco and Lo Cicero. And it's because of his hard work and his earning capability that they're going to make him a captain. And it's just not true. It's bullshit. He's inserting himself in big events. And we've seen this a million times. And what's truly amazing about the Magliaco thing is that Greg Scarpa is going to talk in depth about Lo Cicero wanting to kill Joe Magliaco and sending Greg Scarpa to break into his home and case the joint and get ready to kill him. None of that's fucking true. None of it's true. None of it's true. None of it. He's also going to give up Tommy E. Bully, Anthony Strollo, Salvatore Badalamente, Joe Bonanno, Paul Castellano, Joe Colazzo, Joe Colombo, uh, Pete DeFeo, Neil Della Croce, Pete Ferrara, Harry Fontana, Nicholas Forlano, John Fransoni Francis, Joe Gallo, Larry Gallo, Carlo Gambino, Vito Genovese, Sox Lanza, Charles Lo Cicero, his buddy, Carmine Labardazzi, Tommy Lucchese, Ambrose Magliaco, Joe Magliaco, uh, who else is he going to give up? John Otto, Charles Panarella, Salvatore Peptone, Joe Peptone, Carmine Persico, Salvatore Profacci, Salvatore Scarpa, his own fucking brother, Mimi Cialo, George Trapiano, Ralph Trapiano, and more. And this is a guy who has been a federally paid informant for like two fuck, three fucking months. Not even a fucking year. Three fucking months. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. And when he starts getting into the Magliaco thing, the reason why I find that so intriguing, and we'll we'll remind everybody next week, we'll go a little more in depth with what happened between Magliaco, Bonanno, and and, and Carlo Gambino. But to insert yourself as a decision maker in that is unbelievably fucked up because it's not true. It's 100% not true. Now, what is true is Charlie Lo Cicero does get killed, but for other reasons. But he, but Scarpa tries to make it sound like there's a coup between Lo Cicero and Magliaco. And that's not what the fucking issue was. The issue was... Everybody was afraid of infighting within the Colombo crime family. You had the Gallo feud and all of that nonsense going on as well. But what you had was Bonanno wanting to have an ally in Magliaco because they wanted to stop 
the Lucchese Gambino Genovese combination. And the only way to do that is to kill them. And when Joe Colombo is handed the reins to take care of the hits, he rats them out. He runs to Carlo and tells him. And we know what Carlo does then. All right, we're going to shelve Magliaco. We're going to allow him to live. He's going to pay a penalty. And I want Joe Bonanno here too. Joe Bonanno doesn't show up. And that effectively ends Joe Bonanno's reign as a boss. And really everything in the mafia anyway. But for Greg Scarpa to kind of like put himself in that is absolute fucking nonsense. I could name a hundred guys in 1962 in June that were above him in rank, in position. It's ridiculous. And so like I always say, you don't have to believe me, but paperwork doesn't lie. All right, so we're going to get out of here today. We are going to be back next week. All new Q&A, all new shit to gossip about and talk about. And we're going to get into the paperwork party part three. And next week's going to get insane because there's shit that it's funny. I got an email the other day. It says, you know, I knew Greg Scarpa was a rat, but Jesus Christ, I didn't know the depth. This is only we've only gone through 60 pages, 70 pages of 20 volumes of 300 pages and more. In some cases, the pages are 800. We could sit here and talk about this for the next fucking two years uninterrupted four hours a day. But we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. And so for all of these fucks that continue to say, oh, rats don't lie, they tell the truth. Let me just bring up one last point. (laughs) Jimmy Calandra has been photoshopping photos of him in in Tommy Karate Patera. I do know Tommy Karate Patera. We're friendly. And I know for a fact he doesn't...